live now. So it's on a preview. I'm just waiting for it to pop. Once the stream pops on my phone, there's like a 20 to 30 second delay. Then we can, uh, then I'll do the switch over. Perfect. So how long, how long are you going to try this? It's the first one. You're my first guest ever, man. Like, I, I was thinking of who am I going to do this with? Who's like the ultimate badass to do this with? And I, it was just you. It was you. And so... I, I would love to be uh, on again, like, whenever it's refined. <laughs> well, this is kind of like a... Um, the segment was, was born kind of out of a thing of where everyone's talking cyber and everyone's doing all these webinars and, 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 and so forth, but... The idea is just to have a conversation between two people. Two people that yeah. you and I can have a conversation for hours. So I was like, this would be like perfect. And I'm just waiting for the. There we go. I see it. I've got the stream in front of me, so if we get any questions, we'll be able to. We're gonna I'm gonna switch over to live here in just three, two, one. Hey everyone, James Azar here with CyberHub Engage. Welcome to our first ever inaugural episode of Cyber and Life. Um, part of our kind of Cyber Hub Engage community engagement here in these times where everyone's working from home and everyone's kind of trying to figure out how to pass the time and, and, and beyond just trying to sell you stuff or beyond just trying to put out content, I wanted to bring my first guest who's someone I've known for, for quite some time and I've never really had him on the podcast before and I should and will probably will after this, uh, Michael F. D. Anaya. He's the head of cyber risk operations somewhere new. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also a former FBI agent and he's just he's an all-around great great guy he's just always in the know Michael thanks for for coming on this morning man we hey, are live we are live on LinkedIn who would have thunk it LinkedIn would become a video platform <laughs> well I appreciate you uh asking me to be on your inaugural show that's awesome well I was thinking who would be a really good special guest first time around and it was you man it was there was no one else but you because you you come from that background you lie to me <laughs> <laughs> it's you you come from that background man it's 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 always um it's always really interesting because you know you look at what's going on right now like people like you and i we've been working remote for a while right for a lot of people like 80% of the population, because that's why Atlanta traffic sucks, because 80% of people have to commute. This is new. They yeah, don't know, know what to is. do with themselves. Yeah, it, it takes a mental shift. I mean, I shifted about a little over a year ago when I left the FBI. Uh, you're, you don't really work remote when you're a special agent with the FBI. That's not really a possibility. <laughs> uh, but uh, going to the private sector, that became a reality for me. And it was weird. It, it took me probably about... I want to say two or three months to just fully acclimate, and I don't even know if fully acclimate is the right phrase. It's just, it's been to feel a little bit more normal after two, three months of working remote. It, it is a, it takes a while to get accustomed to. It's, you know, I've been doing remote work, I think, for probably just under a decade now. So I'd always go and travel places, but for a while I had a, an office and I hated having to get up and go to an office. Like, it just felt like such a waste getting in my car, having to deal with traffic, driving in, looking for parking, parking my car. I just, I like making my espresso and just coming downstairs and working or, you know, in my office. It, th th there's an inherent beauty to that. That's, that's awesome. My office, you can't sort of see in the background. It's also doubles as a playroom. Oh, that's, <laughs> I saw the basketball thing behind you. So that, that's always fun. <laughs> I cleaned it up a little bit for the show. I'm like, I should probably put the toys away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have kept them. I would have been like, so this is what Michael's doing during the quarantine. Exactly. He's playing exactly. mini basketball, mini baseball. Very competitive at mini basketball. If anyone wants to challenge me, uh, when this is over, you will lose. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you can dunk all day long. Uh, all, um, my kids have no chance against me. <laughs> Reject it. Better get used yeah, to it. Like, Dad, we don't play with you anymore. <laughs> Toughen up, cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, kind of uh, uh, shifting a little bit into cyber. <laughs> the, the, um, this COVID-19 pandemic has really kind of uh, changed um, a lot of things. We talk about people working from home, but how has it changed cyber criminals? How has it changed their behavior? Uh, so that was a big shift of gears, right? <laughs> well, you know, we go from hey, you dunking, okay. <laughs> we, we go, you know, rejecting your kids, no basketball, no sports. <laughs> like for, we're praying that football season doesn't get canceled at this point, right? <laughs> Baseball, gone. Basketball, gone. Olympics, gone. Euro, gone. By the way, how about those cyber criminals? Are they gone too? Are they yeah. on an extended <laughs> vacation? That, that, that's the unfortunate thing, right? They don't, they don't stop. So cyber criminality is still in play. Um, bad actors, this is a prime time for them. Uh, ultimately, it allows them to take advantage of a lot of vulnerabilities that are going to be persistent. You highlighted a few things. One, that companies aren't accustomed or people aren't accustomed to this. Well, corporations aren't accustomed to this. So they're trying to get security measures up in place. They're trying to make sure everything's properly configured, which is probably one of the biggest vulnerabilities that cyber criminals are going to take advantage of. Not just criminals, but nation state actors. This is a ample opportunity for them. So they unfortunately are not affected the same way everyone else is by COVID-19. But you would think that, you know, and, and again, this is just I'm not saying I know this to be true, but if we're all under quarantine, those a-holes are under quarantine too, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, unfortunately not, right? Because they, the, they have the avenue of the internet, like we're communicating. Um, most of those individuals are quarantined anyway, just because <laughs> of how they operate. But um the reality is most threats that you're likely going to experience um, and be aware of. So you'll most of us get these emails almost daily. Uh, the email providers are pretty good about filtering and putting them in the spam folder. But those emails that are incessant, those aren't sent from your next door neighbor. Many times those emails stem from um, Nigeria. There's a lot of Nigerian fraud. Now, historically, people talked about the Nigerian prince. Every time I mention Nigeria, everyone talks about this Nigerian <laughs> prince character. And that was something back that I think that early 2000s, the Nigerians are behind a lot of business email compromises. These are situations where you have a trusted relationship with someone and then all of a sudden there's an injection or someone else intercepts a communication and you start communicating with that person thinking it's the individual you trust when it's really not. Nigerians are beh behind a lot of those schemes. They're also behind a lot of romance schemes as well as these COVID schemes. They're doing anything to sort of take advantage of the situation. So. Um, I don't quite know what the situation is in Nigeria, to be honest with you, but ultimately they've been operating in this way for decades and they're going to continue to do it. So that's where a lot of the fraud actually comes from, as well as Eastern Europe. But Nigeria is a hotbed for this activity. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this is an opportunity for bad actors. I mean, they're just like us to some degree. They just have a slightly different or, depending on your perspective, very different moral compass. But they're opportunists. So one of the things you just mentioned in terms of like the Nigerian scams is just last week, the FBI here in Atlanta arrested a few Nigerians for business email compromise, confidence and romance scams. Um, when, when you were in the FBI, was that just kind of like, you know, outside of the big stuff, all, all the kind of, you know, small, I, I, I say small, but they're not really small, $20 million frauds, $15 million frauds that are made up of millions of victims all come from, from those kind of uh, cyber criminals? Exactly. Uh, so when I was in the FBI, I actually built that task force that actually facilitated that arrest in the Atlanta field office. I was the one who sort of pioneered it and actually got it up and going. But the reason why I did that was because of how pernicious and prolific these individuals are. Um, it isn't one of the sexier cases to work when you're working within the FBI. Typically, those cases are ones where you're focused on data breaches, uh, hackers, those are the individuals that people are trying to really go after. Right. But the vast majority of criminal schemes are all dealing with business email compromise. It is just prolific. The reason being is because it's so easy to do. It's not complex. It's not convoluted. It really is many times, depending on the sophistication of the actor, you have nation state actors who will facilitate this, but you also have individuals who are just starting their criminal schemes or don't have a lot to actually work with they're able to get up and running really quickly. You know, it's, um, and, and in this period of time where, 
the accounts uh, payable person isn't near the CFO or the CEO. They're working from home and they could be in Nashville, Tennessee, while the CEO's in New York and the CFO's in Dallas, Texas. What are some of the best practices you would recommend for people to kind of build up a, a, uh, another firewall against business email compromise scams? Um, so there's different things that they could do. Um, I actually have something out there on LinkedIn. It deals with um, kind of home security. I, I, I'm going to actually repost this and make it a little bit more prevalent so people can take advantage of it. But these are just four things that I came up with. This was all before uh, the COVID-19 thing actually happened. I'll put out some various material on LinkedIn. It's, it's non-branded. It's free to use. It's not affiliated with any corporate entity or anything. It's just me just trying to create awareness. But some things that organizations could take advantage of right now and make sure they have in play is just simple things that many of us know, but some of these are maybe new for certain individuals or things they might forget. But ensure your employees all have antiviral and hardware firewalls in play. Hardware firewall might be a little bit more difficult to do, but having AV for everyone um, is something to be mindful of. The other component too is to say no to family members using your corporate devices. And it's a nice thing for companies to remind their employees of that. Because everyone's working from home now, there's a potential, depending on the type of infrastructure and different hardware that you're giving your employees. But if you give your employees some mobile devices, including like an iPad, it's going to be potentially tempting for that employee to hand it to their son or daughter to sort of keep them busy. Those are things you definitely don't want to do. And it's good to remind your employees to sort of not do that. Um, the third thing I talk about is just kind of lock down your home from physical threat. That's just good for home security, but it's actually also good for the corporate security as well and encourage your employees to do that. If you think about your corporate setting, there's a lot of security components built into that. You might have an on-site security guard. You might actually have gated access to the facility itself. You might actually might have camera systems and all these different other mechanisms in play. Home security, those are all gone. So to encourage your employees to sort of secure their home, if someone breaks into that home, the first priority is protecting that family and themselves. But if they have corporate assets there, that's something that's going to be exposed. And then the company is going to basically deal with that after the fact. The final thing I talk about in this particular uh, one pager is just having a virtual private network in play. Having VPN is a necessity. Um, and one of the things I saw recently that the Department of Homeland Security was chatting about was the misconfiguration of VPNs, the virtual private networks. Right. But having one in play is pivotal because it allows you to have a secure communication tunnel from your so that's definitely something that companies need to be mindful mindful of so those are four things that i think companies can do now that are relatively easy and um they can actually i mean they deploy relatively soon and quickly you know when you, you talk about vpn and it's so true you know the challenge i think people have with vpn is we saw late last year and early this year you know with the citrix and the pulse vpn and the fortnet vpn and and all those different vulnerabilities that really created another risk surface that i feel like even as a sysO myself has made me reconsider which VPN provider i use what kind of vpn can i trust and how do i ensure that doesn't happen again I mean, our friends over at uh, Finestra are going through a ransomware attack that happened on Friday. And, you know, some of the reports are saying that it was because, you know, of uh, they didn't really patch their vulnerabilities just as fast or, or, or update their software um, on time. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those things are, are potentially tedious and they're problems of standard operating procedures. Um, and that's generally speaking, when I was with the Bureau, um, many cases that I've responded to or oversaw directly had to do with misconfigurations. They had the security protocols in play, but they weren't configured appropriately. Um, or like, I'll give you one example. There was a med, I won't name the facility. That's fine. There was a, a large medical facility in Atlanta. Uh, a group of their physicians decided they were frustrated with IT for taking so long to sort of build infrastructure for them to put patient data on they decided to do it themselves, which is just brilliant, right? <laughs> they have a bunch of doctors put together a database. Well, they did. And so they built this infrastructure. They use a Mongo database, which, and at the time, and I don't know if Mongo still does this, but there's no security on it whatsoever. It's wide open. The physicians didn't know this. So they're loading it with customer details, patient information, and it was just sitting out there. Now they're accessing it, but so were bad actors. And so 
uh, we were made aware of the breach and it uh, we must have been a breach because it was so it was open like literally anyone if you knew the ip address could then navigate to it and go there the physicians had no idea they weren't aware that they were exposing patient information it was uh, something that really had to do with configuration they could have and if they used the right security configurations protected that data but again they weren't specialized in that arena those are things you want to be mindful of um, so what you talked about are actual security companies who have products that are designed for security but there are situations where you have a bunch of organizations designers marketers solopreneurs everyone else out there have these situations where they're going to have access to data you want to make sure that data is secure especially now if you have other remote employees accessing accessing that same data point yeah it almost creates um if, if you weren't a mature cyber organization you've almost been slapped to maturity um right now with with this COVID 19 pandemic how has this changed um you know based on your experience how has this changed the way um um, organizations and law enforcement are, are are essentially practicing cyber. Has this really changed the paradigm in your in, in in kind of in your opinion? Has this pandemic really changed the paradigm in terms of what are we securing and how are we securing it? Potentially, I mean, I think it, it's hard to it's hard to see it um, at this stage. It's so early, but I definitely think you're going to have more vulnerabilities in play. I think when things settle down, you'll be able to step back and actually kind of pontificate a little bit more about what we could have done. I think there'll be a lot of that after the fact, but there'll definitely be highlighting some vulnerabilities. When it comes to law enforcement, law enforcement, they adapt. Um, I'm not in the Bureau anymore, but the Bureau is highly adaptive. So is Secret Service, so is local law enforcement. When it comes to cyber threats, the key players out there are the FBI and the United States Secret Service. So the main two elements in play. So they're adapting. The problem many times with federal law enforcement is it takes time to get cases prosecuted. Um, There's a recent uh, case that was prosecuted by the Department of Justice. It was highlighted recently about the first COVID uh, virus fraud enforcement case. It was a civil right. case. It wasn't criminal. Um, but basically, there was a website that was selling allegedly fraudulently COVID-19 vaccine kits. Right. President was, Trump spoke about that yesterday. So, I mean, it's an easy win. For the U.S. government, what they what they especially did is they basically um, they obtained a temporary restraining order, and, and this is what the United States government can do: obtain a, a temporary restraining order to shut down a business, a website, a broad range of activity upon just showing probable cause that wire fraud has occurred or is likely to occur. So they can shut down sites and shut down businesses, and that's where the civil component comes in. So that's good, but what people don't realizes that doesn't mean they can arrest the people behind it you can shut down the site but it's easy for a site to then find another host and service provider change the domain and be up and running in order to actually take everything out you actually have to build a case on the threat actors on the individual facility and fraud scheme that takes time that's really where in situations you have in right now as environment law enforcement really can't help you directly or immediately doesn't mean you shouldn't share information. I encourage everyone to share information with law enforcement, but just know it takes them time to build those cases because it takes a lot to get something into the court system. You have to have beyond a reasonable doubt that this person was behind the scheme and that takes time to build. And and, and it takes resources and the laws don't always support the what the bad guys can do and what we can do as good guys to get them aren't exactly identical. They're able, like you said, they're able to put up more servers and you know you so they're able to do a lot of different things and that kind of takes me to to one of the questions i asked you early on which is you know these these bad guys um you always say they're in quarantine but one of the discussions you and i've had before is a lot of these bad guys operate like businesses i mean they have offices that you know it could we see maybe possibly more reckless exposure now that they're maybe all kind of doing this outside of their natural habitat uh, you mean reckless exposure by themselves yeah. to make them more evident? Yeah, potentially. I mean, you might see that. Um, it just really depends on kind of how they operate. I don't know if they really would change their TTPs candidly. Um, they do it for a number of reasons. One is to basically keep their identity protected. And that's <laughs> ultimately... <laughs> <laughs> that's the beauty of cyber and life, man. Your son yeah. had to walk in. He needed there's, to there's, toys. There's, there's a baby behind me. 
Um, it reminds me of that one video with that one guy on, on CNN YouTube. when and his I, kids run into the room while he's. <laughs> I love that. That's so awesome. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> so one of the things that uh, cyber actors do is they use monikers. They uh -huh. use uh, names and they, so like example, if you and I were cyber actors, we would never meet like this. We would never communicate face to face. Right. Uh, we'd never be on video. I mean, these are all just things cyber criminals don't do. But I would know you by your moniker, you know me by my moniker. And we might chat a little bit, we might share a little bit, but we don't have to and we can lie. So you sort of think that's gonna change and you're gonna have criminals say, you know what, let's get a business and operate. That's not how they do things. Now, right. Different organizations, like if you're looking at nation state actors, they're different, right? Those situations, you have um, people who are actually going to a job on a daily basis. They go into facilities, they work with others, all focused on trying to ascertain information. That's a different situation. Yeah, it's 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 very different when it comes from a, from from a, an attacker perspective. It seems like we've simplified almost the way they can attack today. Um, simply because now we're outside of the, uh, I like to call them the business firewalls. And <laughs> he wants to say hi. <laughs> That's the beauty of working from home when you've got kids. <laughs> it's, you'll be on the most important conference call in the world, and you know, you're there, or you'll be on a. On, I can't tell you how many times I've had that happen where, you know, I'll be talking to someone and then the baby will start crying or the kids will come in and be like, dad, 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 play with me or mom. Do you see the one with the conference call, the Zoom call where the lady just went into the bathroom and forgot her camera was on? <laughs> no, <you're not. laughs> That's so awesome. That's so so awesome. We're, 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 this is our new reality. Um, well, it, it's kind of nice, though. Like that was my eldest son. Uh, we had I had a conference call the other day, and I he came in the room, and he just gave me a hug. Like it was the nicest thing. Like that's never happened at work. <laughs> like, you, know, you, don't have, <laughs> you don't have random people typically come and giving you hugs. Well, but if you do, it's sexual harassment too. It's <laughs> like you're invading my personal space. Social but, distancing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But uh, I did not file a uh, a complaint against him when he hugged me. It was it was super cute. It was no. just like, oh, that's that's it's just nice. It's like kind of like a nice uh, reminder. It, there are really good things potentially that be able to spend more time with your family. It's not ideal, but small victories like that are kind of nice. You know, kind of uh, uh, as as we wrap this segment up, I will say this: um, working from home has introduced kids to their parents and parents to their kids in ways that weren't there before. Yeah. And there's an inherent good about this because one of the things a lot of, a lot of people have been talking about is community. And in this time, community typically starts with a family and then it grows and it becomes a community. And so now we're able to go back to the foundation of our community, which is our families, our neighbors, our neighborhoods, um, and then grow from there, our churches, our synagogues, and so forth. And there's there's an inherent beauty about America at a time of crisis. It seems like at a time of crisis, outside of those pricks in Washington, you don't have to comment. Um, everyone else in America, everyone else in America don't care about race, creed, religion, color, you name it. Just people are out there helping each other. I saw yesterday some of our neighbors um, that just got back. They, they got back. They had to go into quarantine um, and came home yesterday and they had you know they had no tp they had no, no no nothing and they can't find it anywhere in the stores so every you know they kind of went around saying hey could you spare some and everyone's you know they were just they had their car parked in our cul-de-sac and everyone was taking stuff out for them right just to help them to, you know nice. to get through until you know that's that's the beauty of our nation that's the beauty of doing of of, of doing stuff is this is where we're at michael and it's it's you know, I'm not saying we should get used to this, but we shouldn't forget this when this is all over. We should remember our community and the people who supported us and not let this kind of uh, be just, oh, that was a period in my life, you know, on my Instagram stories or, or Facebook stories. But it should really be something that uh, reminds us of the roots of what it is to be an American and, and, and live in this great country. I, think. I agree. No, I agree with you. I mean, yeah. I, think, I think it's for me, it's a nice reminder of the importance of family. And, uh, you know, again, when I was with the FBI, I didn't have an opportunity to work from home. Um, 
FBI for agent, you have to work mandatory 50 hours a week. And so I'd work many times more than that. So I was, my reality was I was coming home just in time to spend 30 minutes with my kids. Um, so fast forward to current day, you know, I had to see them throughout the day. Uh, it's such a blessing to be able to spend more time with them. So hopefully that's one of the things we can all take is just spending some time with family. If, if you have that opportunity, not everyone has the opportunity because potentially they're estranged from their family or their family's in another city they can't actually go visit. But um, if you have the opportunity, that's it's a great time to sort of take advantage of it. You know, it's um, we, we're almost out of time. And so uh, I always say life segments shouldn't go more than 30 minutes. I, I don't think people have the attention span of more than 30 minutes. I did get a question from um, one of our friends over on Facebook. And give me just a second. I want to kind of read that off to you. Um, thank you so much, too. Let's see who it is. Um Omri Mizrahi, he's from Israel, cyber guy. Um, and what he's asking is, what can organize, what, with a lot of organizations being global and attacks now spreading to different parts of the world, what recommendations would you have in terms of building a layer of security globally now? Because, you know, if you've got, if you've got four or five different offices and you've got an India and Israel, London, um, New York, and let's say uh, uh, LA, you know, you're dealing with different time zones, different people, and they're all working from home. W- what would be some of your tips in terms of managing that from a security perspective? Uh, so we don't have a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to default to generic device or advice in this instance, just because it's, it would take me too long to send, go on to the nuances of how to store a secure network in that environment. But some of the key components I talk about with people, one, build a team. You have to have a team of people to empower that team, uh-huh. empower the security team, ensure that they have not only the funding, but they actually have the, the uh, your blessing to pursue those avenues to secure the network. Layer security is the third element. Uh, the fourth one is create awareness, have an awareness campaign internally, not just a one-time seminar or one flyer you create, but an ongoing training of your personnel. That's huge. And the final thing, the fifth element that organizations should do, especially in a global environment, is share information with one another. That's pivotal. But you don't just share with one another, you share with law enforcement. We talked about earlier how law enforcement takes some time to sort of build a, a case against a threat actor. It's much more difficult to do in cyber arena because you have criminals who are global. So being able to share information with law enforcement when you see it, indicators of compromise, Sharing that is pivotal. One, it helps your neighbors. It helps the community at large. But also, you know, you know, I know we would love to do this, but we can't arrest anyone. You know, I've lost my arrest authority, uh, James. <laughs> and so companies are in the same boat. They can't arrest the threat actor. But all they can do is report it to law enforcement. Law enforcement power to actually take the threat out of play. So you got to share that data. And, and we have a Department of Justice that is not afraid to go and chase people down and extradite them. You've been involved in many cases where you guys have extradited cyber criminals from all over the world to the U.S. to face the strong arm of justice. And so there's, you know, one thing I will tell you is my experience with law enforcement anytime I've been part of an incident has been stellar. Professionality, the ability for them to really um, give you insight into other places to look into. So, you know, people don't, People always think of, uh, of, of, of law enforcement uh, in the terms of TV, right? Yeah. CSI. And I think a lot of times they, or, or law and order, <laughs> I think a lot of times they miss the fact that FBI and Secret Service are so technologically advanced that when you're going through any sort of cyber incident, they'll not only come and grab data, they'll look at stuff with you and tell you, you should probably check this. We've seen in cases where an attack has had a similar TTPs where they've also gone this way and this way and this way. You should, you know, check all of those as well. That's invaluable data that typically or, you know, whoever your incident response provider is may not have. Um, simply because they're on site always dealing with this and they don't rarely crunch data. That's at least been my experience is I get more out of the FBI and secret service than I do out of some of the incident response teams I deal with um, because they're just there to fix and get you back up. And those guys are there to fix, investigate and solve. You, you basically uh, hit the nail on the head and that's one key component. I think many organizations sometimes forget. And I always offer, you know, uh, people can share and ask me for advice, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I can do this, again, no charge, just me just share information. 
But one of the key components that companies sometimes forget or lose optics into is that the FBI, Secret Service, they're not there to, they're not a regulatory body. They're not there to fine you. They're not there to treat you as a subject. You're a victim, you've been victimized. And what the FBI and Secret Service, all they want to do is identify that threat actor and eliminate it. That's it. Yep. Like they're not there and they're not there to create press releases or big media storms. That's not what the Bureau does. And you guys don't show up wearing your, well, you, you don't anymore, but you don't show up wearing your FBI jackets like TV. No, no, no. Like exactly. If <laughs> it's discreet. Comes, exactly. When companies are proactively reaching out to law enforcement, I encourage them to do it before anything happens, right? Um, if you're sitting there listening to this and figuring out, well, how do we do that? You can contact me, but ultimately you contact your local FBI or Secret Service office, develop that relationship, ask them, hey, what happens if there's a data breach? How do you guys work? Just ask that question. They'll explain it to you. They only want a few things and none of it is your proprietary information. They don't want to shut you down. They don't want to charge anyone. All they want to figure out is who did this. Remember, companies that have been breached, they're the victim. Right. So that's one key component. I think sometimes companies aren't actively aware of. They're concerned that, oh crap, I did something wrong. I'm gonna be in trouble. That's not the case. So what is your, what is one or one piece of advice as we kind of sign off on the first cyber in life around what are you doing in this quarantine time to really keep yourself occupied, keep your brain sharp and get away from the uh, conference call uh, zoo that I like to call every hour, jump on another call. Have you seen the conference call bingo thing? I know, but my calendar is packed with me. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. Uh, literally, so I started a new job and it's just meeting after meeting after meeting. Uh, it's good. Though. I'm learning a lot. So much to take in. Um, so, but what am I doing? Uh, besides spending time with family, uh, one thing I put actually, I, 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 this is kind of fun for me. I like doing presentations and speaking in public, but because I can't do that right now, um, I've been putting together some one pagers. I put one recently, I posted on LinkedIn today. It's just simple, five things you can do to spot a phishing email. That's one of the key components that's happening right now. Um, a checkpoint, a cybersecurity company posted something where about 4,000 domains were created with some sort of connection with COVID-19. The vast majority of them are probably legitimate, but there's gonna be a high percentage that are not. That started me thinking, I was like, people should be aware of these five simple things. And so I just I put a one pager. Come it's it's on the screen next to you right now. You don't oh, see excellent. it, but everyone who's watching can see it. Um, it replaced my ugly mug with, <laughs> your, with your flyer. And so it's it's on the screen for everyone to see right now. So perfect. So this is just like, you know, I have a questionable domains, poorly written, suspicious links, generic greeting, and sense of urgency. If you look at an email, you have all five of those things in play. You're looking at a phishing email. Don't click on it delete it, report it to ic3.gov. Uh, but this is something companies can take. They can, and again, there's no branding, download it, send it to their employees. One simple thing you can do to create more awareness. It's easy to read. Um, I have some lighthearted statements in there to make it kind of enjoyable. But ultimately the idea is just to share information. I, I love talking to people, sharing information. And so in, in this time where I'm isolated, I'm spending my downtime which is like literally it was late last night and I was finalizing that and then this weekend putting that stuff together. It's uh it's it's awesome. Michael F D Anaya folks, former FBI agent, ultimate OG as we like to Micah gave you the title of the threat hunting OG. Um I know you as probably one of the most knowledgeable people um in, in cybersecurity not only from a law enforcement perspective but also from how bad guys operate and and, and always fun to have you on. Can't wait to have you on a full on podcast, Michael. We should uh definitely plan that now that we've got time. It'll <laughs> That's be true. I agree. It'll, it'll be a blast. Um thank you so much for coming for uh, all of those watching on linkedin uh thank you for uh some of your questions we are uh starting the cyber and life segment as kind of a way to uh not only talk cyber but also you saw we we got interrupted by michael's uh, oldest son who came <laughs> through the room and just let his dad know hey dad we're outside playing but we love you we miss you don't go away for 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 too long and um that's part of our reality for right now we'll get through it together um 
Thank you so much for listening. On Thursday, um, bring in your questions. We will have a Wall Street economist talking about the economic impact of uh, COVID-19 to businesses, to your personal life, uh, what you can expect. Um, and so, you know, file in your questions now. We'll be on at 3 o'clock Eastern time on Thursday um, with uh, Jordan, not Jordan Belfort, uh, a different Jordan, um, one who's been around for about 40 some odd years on Wall Street. And, and very, very knowledgeable kind of talking about the uh, economic impact of this and answering your questions. Um, until next time, folks, uh, make sure you subscribe to our page and share this live. We'll be back with more later today. Until then, have a great rest of your day and stay cyber safe.